is Hal Bastian uh, speaking to you from the corner of Third and Spring in the 1898 Douglas Building. And I'm really excited to be here with a terrific panel today. We have over 100 people uh, here uh, for our presentation today. And uh, I know a lot of us are, uh, you know, have a little bit of Zoom fatigue. And so I want to turn that around and just say, I think this is a fabulous way to get a lot of people from all over the region to hear really innovative and uh, interesting things and not make a really bad carbon imprint <laughs> on the environment. So I think it's a good thing and, and embrace that technology. I'm honored to be here today. I'd like to thank, uh, thank Dan Gaiman uh, for asking me to moderate uh, our panel today. And we're gonna have a good time. Uh, all the people on the screen are very, very skilled professionals in architecture, and you can uh, find their uh, their bios on the registration page where you where you um, uh, signed up for uh, for this today. Um, right now, what I'd like to do is to introduce uh, our speakers, uh, Dan Gaiman with Danellian uh, Associates, along with his associate uh, Victor Al Alvarez. Uh, Barbara Bester uh, with Bester Architecture, and Karin Liljegren and Albert Escobar with Om Givney. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the person without whom none of this would be happening, hmm. the guy that th threw down the friendly gauntlet to the uh, design and architecture community about thinking new ways about, you know, maybe increasing some housing and some housing density uh, it, and we're going to hear all about fourplexes uh, today. Uh, Christopher Hawthorne is the chief design officer for the city of Los Angeles. Uh, he was appointed to that very special position by Mayor Garcetti. And he's a former architecture critic uh, of the LA Times. And I had the privilege of meeting Christopher many, many years ago. And Chris, thanks for being here. And why don't you set the table? So we'll, we'll go through and then we'll do our presentations and then have a nice discussion. Thanks so much, Hal. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, really great to be with all of you. First thing I want to do is congratulate all the winners in this category. Um, look forward to hearing the presentations. Uh, this is really an example of the architects themselves really generating a public program in order to share the details about their schemes. And I, I think that's fantastic. And I'm um, happy to see how much interest there is. We have continued to get a re really remarkable amount of interest in this uh, design challenge, whether that was um, press coverage when we launched or our coverage and interest now that we have announced the winners and are moving toward the next steps, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, very briefly, the genesis for this design challenge was really to put on the agenda in a more direct way, the future of our single family and low rise neighborhoods across the city. Those neighborhoods make up more than 80% of the residential land in Los Angeles. Uh, it's clear that we have a land use and zoning policy in those territories that is not sustainable for the 21st century in terms of climate change and locating housing near jobs and transit. And also in terms of the history of the city has not fully reckoned with histories of and legacies of redlining, racist lending and zoning practices and other kinds of exclusionary housing policy that are really chiefly responsible for the gap in uh, household wealth that we see divided along uh, racial and ethnic lines in Los Angeles as in so many other cities. So it was clear that we need to engage with this question. On the other hand, there has been very little political incentive for elected officials to wade into that territory. In fact, the conventional wisdom has largely been that um, there is only downside to, to wading into that territory, only backlash and, uh, and even vitriol. So we wanted to uh, produce a design challenge that would um, set the table for a more productive conversation. And I think today's session is, is part of that. Um, and we started by really trying to rethink how architectural competitions work, how they operate, how they're organized in some fundamental ways at the very beginning of this process. Um, one of the unfortunate dynamics of typical traditional architectural competitions is sometimes they act to take architectural visions by firms outside of communities and impose them on communities in ways that are not always super productive. Um, and we wanted to turn that inside out. So we actually started by having significant community engagement listening sessions, five in all. Uh, we made those required viewing for all the entrants. We uh, used the material that we um, 
that we heard in those sessions to inform the brief. Um, and then we asked a number of those participants, um, facilitators and panelists in those sessions to join us as, uh, as jurors um, in, in the competition itself. Um, and the jury is also was really an effort to rethink how we do this. I'm gonna share my screen. You're gonna see a whole bunch of beautiful um, designs. I'm gonna start by putting a whole bunch of text on the screen um, uh, just to talk about, uh, about the juries for this, uh, this competition. So um, I will direct all of you and I'll share this link in the chat as well, but you can go to lowrise.la slash jury to see the list. But we really wanted to have architects, but also tenants, we wanted to have um, affordable housing developers. We wanted to have my colleagues in city government, uh, planning commissioners, writers, critics, um, and a combination of, of uh, Angelinos and locals and also experts from around the world. So this particular jury, the fourplex jury, I think is representative of that diversity. Um, we had, um, in this case, eight, eight jurors because Ken Bernstein and Michelle Levy, my colleagues uh, in the city uh, voted together representing collectively the Urban Design Studio. They also, also had Amy Anderson, who was then the chief housing officer now working on housing funding for Wells Fargo. Ken and Michelle from the Urban Design Studio, uh, Tatiana Bilbao, the architect best based in Mexico City, who uh, is really an expert in residential architecture and housing, Jason Foster, who I was lucky enough to share a panel with earlier today, President and CEO of Destination Crenshaw. Another city colleague, Dominique Hargreaves, uh, Deputy Chief Sustain Sustainability Officer. Uh, Stephanie Klasky gamer who's uh, from LA Family Housing, and then Daniel uh, Parolek, who literally wrote the book on Missing Middle uh, Housing. And um, as a result of the way we organized those juries, I think we really did have conversations about what the most worthy entries were that were different from any that I have participated in uh, as a member of a competition jury. Really thinking about community aspiration, how different designs would play in communities as well as questions related to architecture uh, and design. And I think you'll see that play out as you see the presentations from the three winning teams. And the last thing I'll say in closing is that um, the next steps for this uh, process have to do with this kind of conversation, uh, taking the winning designs out to a range of communities, um, community groups, even homeowners associations into the belly of the beast as it were to get feedback on which kinds of elements really appeal to folks which uh, represent uh, the kinds of housing options that they would like to see in their community and maybe maybe the opposite too, maybe things that don't seem like they're such a good fit for particular communities. And then we're um, actively uh, folding that input back into uh, the work that we're doing to update the fundamental uh, building blocks of our housing policy we are updating the housing element of our general plan and the draft of that element is now out and includes references to low rise. Um, and we're continuing to work on the final version of that as well as updates to all of the community plans across the city, all 35 of them. The first of those updates for downtown is now out and others are following suit and there's a very close relationship between uh, the proposals and ideas that were generated as a result of this initiative um, and that work. Um, so this is this conversation, as I said, is really uh, central to how we think about the next steps and how we think about where uh, this initiative goes from here. So thanks for the opportunity to say a few words of, of introduction and uh, look forward to the conversation. How back to you. Great. Hey, thank you so much, Mr. Hawthorne. It's a terrific to have you and what fun we're going to have right now. So um, Daniel, uh, your, your team came in uh, third place in this fourplex. We're going to start off. Uh, we're going to give everybody about about eight minutes uh, to do their uh, their presentations, and about one minute. I'm going to interject one minute, please, just like that, and uh, so you don't have to be watching me wave my hands or anything else. And then uh, we'll have a chat. So Daniel, take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Hal, and thanks everybody for signing up and being here. Um, Christopher, thank you so much for that intro, and it just reminds us once again of uh, the premise of this Design Ideas Challenge was to really think about how people live and to be thinking about how we can pave a way for people to have acceptance of this, these denser sort of communities. 
and to create things like uh, wealth generation opportunities, lots of things we think about not normally in the realm of what architects think about because we're form givers. Um, our team was profoundly influenced by the listening sessions and we got together and, and pooled everybody's interests and said what we were going to do. And as it turns out, one of my colleagues who I'll introduce in a second actually has a family situation right now in Los Angeles that lent itself to a consideration of how we put projects that are a bit denser into existing communities, neighborhoods, families, and fabric. And so he's gonna take us through that. I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Victor Alvarez. Buenas tardes, gracias, Daniel. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, my name is Victor Alvarez. And our, like Daniel was saying, let me share the screen. Um, the family that, uh, that we use is my extended family. And uh, this is what's typical that I see right now with not only this family, but other friends and family throughout the county, throughout the state, that they're trying to come up with ideas. What can they do to help their families move along? And this is a great opportunity that we are able to use this family as an example for their property. And it works great. Here we have, uh, we named it Tia Rosa, but her actual name is Elisa. And as you can see, she's standing next to her beautiful granddaughter on her bride day. And each side of the family, you have her daughters and their families, uh, Maria and Yolanda. Um, what's great about this is that we weren't coming up with a solution, which is an architectural solution, but we were working as a team with the Idea Lab, with the people we have in the office come bringing all ideas together, is come up with a solution for their needs. And in this uh, situation, uh, they, uh, the uh, Elisa owns the property outright, uh, and she wants to make sure that if she leaves a legacy, she will be 93 years old next month. So it's an excellent thing that she's doing for her family, uh, leaving a legacy. And together with the family, they're talking about creating and turning this property as a, as a living trust that she still has control of what's happening, and but it prepares it for the future on their for their families and growth. And together with them, as we're meeting with them, talking with them, getting their ideas, we talk about their concerns, we talk about what their expectations are. And this concept of having more than one ADU and giving us the opportunity to expand, now they're seeing it more, not only as a solution for their immediate needs, but for future wealth of their children. You know, where maybe one of the units can be used by their uh, grandson. Um, so on and so forth, you know, and, and that's what makes it wonderful. And what we've done is how can we use our own um, trade within our families? You know, we have family members, neighbors and friends who are within the trade that we're able to draw our, our resources together to make this possible. Uh, one of the uh, uh, son-in-laws, uh, Frank, works for a major lumberyard company where he's able to uh, purchase the materials for the construction at a really good pricing. And at the same time, he has connections with consultants, uh, contractors in order to draw that uh, information back. And then you have the other son-in-law who is in the lighting industry with a major company who he's able to draw that resource of information. And then he manages a property himself for his own family. And he has the experience how to manage property this way. And that's, you know, that's great that we're able to work together as a community to make this possible. What, as we were talking with the family, many concerns came up. And, but those are some of the concerns we were able to uh, address them so that Tia Elisa feels more comfortable moving forward. Uh, her major concern is displacement. What's gonna happen to her during the process um, with the property? And as we explained to her, the whole um, process of turning the uh, living trust and also turning the, the pro uh, property into something in the future. And we explained to her the phasing of the, of the construction made her feel at ease and more accepting of the project. The way we uh, laid out part of the plan is splitting the project into two phases. Uh, phase one is the construction of the ADUs. And here on the ADUs, it's located on the back half of the property. As you can see, it's an alley loaded product and allows us to uh, expand and add additional parking without using a lot of the land. So on the ADU 
is, uh, as you can see right here, the smallest ADU is just over 600 square feet with the larger ADU being an 850 square feet. You're looking at a, two of them being a single bedroom, more of a loft type of situation. And then the other one, the two bedroom for a, a, either a small family with a child or something like that. And the idea is preparing the first floor ADU for uh, Tia Elisa and her needs in, in, in the accessibilities so that she could move freely and be more independent on the property. And while she's living in the phase one and we start and we continue moving with the main house remodel is not only the expansion of the property to allow for a larger family or one of her family members to move into the project, but designing the first floor and accommodating all the accessibilities for Tia, uh, Tia Lisa so that she feels comfortable and has a decision where she wants to do it. So you can continue living on the small ADU independently, or she can move into the larger main house with one of the family members where she could be looked at uh, after uh, if she if, if the need comes uh, comes up. And that's what why we phase it out and she works a lot more easier and more accepting of the project. Um, other concerns was, what can we do to reduce the increasing cost of monthly bills? So that's where we said, hey, you know what? We're going to follow what is required by California law in meeting all the Title 24 requirements, but let's take it a further step further ahead and try and become as close as possible to net zero. So that's what we're doing, uh, using some techniques for higher energy efficient walls, doors and windows, uh, introducing certain openings throughout the project so that they could have natural ventilation for those warm days to, so they can reduce it. So it could reduce the amount of space uh, in that. In here, there, you could see that the succulent is part of it so that they could uh, use what they grow into the daily DNA. Because for her, growing vegetation and everything for her use is a great deal for her day-to-day uh, uh, -day, uh, consumption of vegetables and everything that she shares. Here we have the private space is another requirement for the, each one so they could each have their own private entertainment uh, aside from all the major uh, units uh, independent from each other. And here we have the main house where we have a not so traditional uh, tandem parking where the tandem parking doubles up as an outdoor space for the main house and it can flow in and out. So it gives you more unique of that space. And together with all those spaces, as you can see here, we have a central location where it's large enough space so that the kids and neighborhood with the live on the property have somewhere to run around safely away from traffic. And then the grandparents or the babysitters or the parents could continue with their gardening, continue doing their homework or even barbecuing while keep an eye on, keep an eye on the kids. And what's nice about this is that the way these are, are, are located with the help of our designers and coming up with these ideas here and with Idea Lab is that the space can also be used for larger functions. And here you have the quinceanera, you know, and it's very traditional within Latino community, within this community that let's use our facility for this purpose. And who knows, this could be for an annual family uh, reunions and everything that you could use all the different spaces coming together. Because her goal is to create a legacy and the tradition, keep it going for the family. And that's what we're looking for here is, it's not an architectural solution, but a solution of what they need. And the architecture comes with it afterwards, creating something familiar. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Victor. Thank Robert, you. you're up next. And Hi, I'm muting. Thank you so much. Um, someone else I think is running my deck. So we, we also um, were looking at issues around community, in particular a neighborhood that um, I've worked in in different ways, including back in the day on my graduate thesis, but in Frogtown, which is an interesting neighborhood of kind of worker housing between the LA River and the five freeway and the two freeway. It's a kind of snippet of land. And as we speak, the city and the state are improving some of the old rail yards across the river to make them uh, a large park system. And there's also been a new bike path established along the river. So there's a lot of opportunity in this neighborhood to kind of transform it into a legacy 
area for dense, more dense housing. But at the same time, reading those wonderful um, neighborhood interviews and kind of discussing with people in that area, what the concerns are, there's a real neighborhood tapestry there that consists of a kind of, um, you know, we can see in this illustration, this um, overhead, there's kind of existing, mostly one story, single family houses. A lot of them are, you know, 400, 600 square feet, but on very long skinny lots. And our concept was to try, I think if you look at the next slide, um, to, to try to keep that neighborhood context intact, like the fabric of the neighborhood. Um, is someone running the slides there that could show the next image for me? Cassie, maybe, is that you? Um, so on the street above, so you can see the site, that's a, that's a kind of, you know, a, a photo, oh, sorry, no, the, that, the, the one that you just had open, please. Um, Sorry, this is I'm I'm in a remote place that so we thought was safer to have someone else around. So so the site so there's existing kind of bungalows of you know both the kind of craftsman and mission revival idea and our thought was to try and keep that street neighborhood pedestrian context intact and work on these four square ideas that were were kind of inspired by um, an almost economic sociological proposal that. Um, McKinsey did about California densification, the idea being that if you built wood framed houses, like sort of big houses that were actually for four families, that would be by far the cheapest way of densifying all of California because you could, you know, that kind of construction is inexpensive. It's also people could do it almost anywhere. So we wanted to stay in that idea of a, of a, essentially a four square building that is, you know, one building with, um, multiple dwellings within it that can be kind of built inexpensively in a backyard. So, so the model that you see sort of unfolded below shows this idea in our case, it's a pinwheel idea. Maybe the next drawing could help um, show that. Um, it's kind of four, we're, we're making it more literal really for this project, but it's four houses kind of built together. So they're sharing a common core that shares the bathrooms and the staircases, and but they are kind of built together. Um, maybe the next drawing, and the existing house actually in this case is, is in the front here um, at, intact. So in that plan drawing, you can kind of see this core idea. So there's, um, they're staggered, so the bathrooms are on different levels and the different houses, but basically each unit has its own um, patio area. It also has its own bathroom and staircase and they, they kind of wind around each other. And that allows us to do a couple different things. One is to have each, each homeowner has their own entrance. So even though it's a single building, it kind of feels like ind independent entrances and unique you know, at ground level entryways. Um, it also, you can see in the, in the landscape, we're able to put some community space in there, like a Zen garden, a community dining area, and vegetable gardens in the front, so that the whole, the whole um, site has a kind of manifest sort of indoor-outdoor living, that kind of California ideal, but also um, sustainable rainwater, you know, harvested vegetables, etc. cetera. Um, and maybe the next picture would be good. Um, the, I guess this, um, yeah, so this kind of, so, so the, the, we got pretty into the architecture of this in the sense that if we're able to embed the building down into the ground about four feet, it allows us to get full height spaces for three stories, which really gives each unit quite a lot of square footage and a lot of kind of spaciousness, especially on those top floors. Um, but what, what uh, recessing it also does a kind of eco function, which is that it allows us to build a vertical passive cooling system. So all of the staircases are perforated staircases that are open from the ground floor up, and they're able the the air is kind of naturally cooled as it goes down uh, into the ground, and you have this the sort of open air lower levels allow you to bring like if you open your doors the air will kind of come in and it's actually naturally pulled through. It's the same concept that was used in tenements back in the day for like the kind of vertical air stack going through the staircases up to a skylight. Um, this also just shows the, the, you know, the kind of relationship of kind of people and spaces to these different interior things. And then the existing house, we worked with the landscape architecture firm SALT to look at how to make even the walls of the existing building a kind of harvest space for vines and, um, 
the also adding a lot of shade trees in order to create most of the outdoor space that's livable is also naturally shaded. Maybe the next picture is good. Um, so this is kind of more getting into the nitty gritty of how the different units kind of pinwheel around. So they're color coded for the one, two, three, four. They're all fairly similar, but there's essentially two, two pairs of things. And um, the total square footage is and, and density and footprint is really not dissimilar to like a single family house in this area. But because of its verticality, it's, it meets the regular, you know, height limit, but also um, it has that embedded function to allow the three stories. Next picture, maybe. Um, so this is kind of our visual for from the front that the idea that you have um, the intact existing house and how it kind of might work with this. The, the idea is that these each unit could also be customized on the exterior. We had this material that we learned about from our sustainability consultant, which was Arup um, Engineering, about um, a, something called a thermocool coating, which kind of works like uh, stucco, but is actually a much more high tech um, heat resistant material. And there's also like a self cleaning thing on the on the concrete below. So we're kind of looking at new materials too to, for how to build these low cost four unit buildings. Thanks, Barbara. You've got about a minute left to wrap up. Okay, I think there's maybe one more picture. Let's see what we got. I think there's one that has more diagrams that oh, so this is the um, electric appliances and how that air might move. Go ahead to the next picture. I'll scooch through. Is there anything else in there? No. Nope. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So that kind of shows um, some more things about the landscape. Next picture. We'll get out of here in time. Uh, is there another? Yeah. So this was kind of interesting diagram that I was talking about with the per, uh, vertical passive cooling, which is kind of a great thing to look at in general for California as we're getting hotter, like using um, slightly receding our buildings partially into the ground, we can actually use a very ancient technique of vertical cooling. It's actually really popular in the Middle East as well. And kind of extra adding extra fan sucks up that heat stack. Next one, I think that might be it. Well done, Barbara, thanks a lot. How exciting, <laughs> all right. The first place winner, Karen and Albert, take it away. Karen, I think you're muted. Oh my God, that's so funny. And <laughs> being on mute, we were just making a joke that Hal's manifesto was, anyway. <laughs> so I want to do a big shout out to my team because a lot of efforts, Albert as the lead and doing an amazing job. And also Andrew, Alex, Cassie, Joel, Kirsty, Nikki, Norella, Randy, Shar, Taylor, Yuki. And then we collaborated with MLA and from MLA, we worked with Don, Amy, and, and Ian. Um, so we chose to enter the competition because we feel extremely strongly in densifying our city. And we wanted to explore how to densify right. How do we do this right? So we entered two, uh, two categories, subdivision and fourplex. Um, subdivision, we also won second place. And in subdivision, kind of similar to Barbara's, it was, it was about keeping the existing building in the front and um, uh, keeping the character of our, of our streets and our, our neighborhoods and then kind of densifying in the back. And what I liked about the subdivision category was that it was about subdividing the parcels to make them, which also inherently makes them more affordable and approachable in terms of um, ownership. So what drew us to fourplex, um, especially since we're kind of adaptive reuse architects and really, really great at reusing buildings was let's have a blank slate and see what we can do and come up with a, a kind of new framework. So I'm gonna hand it over to Albert to continue. Yeah, thank you, Karen. Uh, so similar to Danielle and, and Associates, uh, we really dove deep into the listening sessions and uh, we, that Christopher Hofton kind of mentioned. And we, as a team, we actually broke up into smaller groups to go over them. And they're about two or three hours long. Uh, we shared major points from each of, the, of them and they kind of informed the design and the process. Uh, some of the examples that stood out to us was like the importance of the car in Latin and black communities and how 
for low-income communi communities, the need for cars is so crucial for their daily life. Another point was the ability for property owners to lend part of their land to community land trusts. So they could build an air duplex or house on the same parcel, allowing for gentrification to occur, um, as well as for both owner and CLT benefiting from that development. And lastly, the idea of sustainable communities, not only as an environmental aspect, but as a social economical one. Uh, and the question of how to keep the fabric of LA neighborhoods and the communities intact, but still be able to develop and densify them. We kind of took these ideas and implemented them into our entries as a way to create a framework for others to use or be inspired by. So our project is called Hidden Gardens and internally we asked ourselves a couple of questions. As cities become more dense, how can they become more equitable, sustainable and porous? How can we create a balance between indoor and outdoor spaces and find the value in those spaces? And how to create a more hum human-centered design and multifamily housing. We wanted to create a framework that could be implemented across an LA neighborhood but not only just to densify it, but also to allow for larger outdoor spaces to become a network within the community. The approach was to look at the site from a macro to micro level and bring forth ideas that property owners, architects, and city officials can start to implement in different communities. Uh, here is the site plan and lot plan. And our proposal is like the pink blocks on, on the site plan. And then the, the blue blocks are kind of like these single existing story housing. Uh, we also have like uh, these communal areas are shown as like this dark green and as you start to multiply our, our model to a neighborhood, these um, communal areas become larger um, as well. Uh, this is an axometric diagram that uh, of the site, uh, which one of our teammates, uh, Taylor Carlin worked on, and it gets, kind of tells a story of how people would live in this type of community. Um, some of the ideas we are proposing is kind of introducing these slow streets and green alleys to reduce the heat island effect and promote uh, pedestrian friendly environments, um, as well as turning the front yard into a community easement that could be owned by a community land trust um, uh, to build and maintain kind of like a micro park or a community garden for the whole neighborhood. Um, also creating kind of communal areas for residents to gather so they can barbecue, sit around, uh, a fire pit and even grow their own vegetables. Uh, and then we also propose kind of minimizing the parking requirements so that only one parking spot is allowed per unit and allowing the flexibility for each resident to decide if they wanna keep it, share it or rent it out. And the design is this three block scheme that is kind of interwoven within the landscape thus creating these different scales of outdoor spaces that range from public to private. Our narrative was always uh, to assume that a generational family could live could live within the complex. Uh, so we, where we had an 80 unit for your grandparents, a one bedroom unit for a single person or a couple and a two bedroom and three bedroom unit for uh, like two families. Um, and then uh, the brief also stated that we had a maximum requirement height of 33 feet, um, but instead we actually kept our building as low as 24 feet. We wanted to demonstrate that densification does not necessarily mean that we need to build uh, taller structures but that proper arrangement of program, narrower building setbacks and new methods of construction can lead to smaller scale communities that are still able to densify and grow at a steady rate without drastically altering the scale of a community. Uh, the landscape that Studio MLA proposed uh, consists of these climate appropriate planting and large shade trees around uh, within the open spaces uh, to get the most sun exposure. They also propose these vegetable beds and fruit trees for the residents as well as uh, stormwater infiltration planners to mitigate water runoff. Uh, Studio MLA was really great to work with. They had a lot of good feedback, not only on the landscape, but also on the architecture. Um, and we also wanted to, to question how two-story housing in California has been typically programmed. Uh, considering California, Southern California has one of the best climates for indoor outdoor living, how can denser topologies be designed for this type of climate? Uh, we introduced this idea of upside down space planning, which positions sleeping spaces at the ground level where they open up the smaller private gardens uh, for each bedroom and locate the living space on the upper level. This allows for living spaces to be directly connected to the private outdoor spaces, which in turn leads to better views, ventilation and daylight for each unit. This is on a large plan of the ground floor and you can kind of see that relationship between the sleeping spaces and the private uh, gardens. Um, and then we also introduced these flexible spaces for residents to use as uh, either music rooms, office spaces, or even like a playroom. 
Um, and regarding the, the, the exterior landscape, um, you can kind of see a close up of the Camino area uh, with the vegetable beds, the fire pit, and the barbecue. And you can kind of see how the, the massing and the block of the project is kind of kind of almost like broken up. And the idea for that was to kind of uh, let air and light through each of the, of the volumes. And um, each space is able to access, um, you know, has a, a side of surface where uh, windows can be placed. Um, uh, this is the second floor. And we wanted to keep the, the second floor really open. So there's this connection between the, the living and dining space and the kitchen. Uh, we have these the circular, the vertical circulation kind of separating both spaces. Uh, but there's also this connection to this private outdoor space that um, each tenant has. And it was really important for us to kind of uh, have that argument of like the, the, the value of outdoor space and like um, what that means for, for people in low income communities. Usually that's, and, the, and usually in new development, that's one of the things that gets taken out of the project is like outdoor space. So we really want to emphasize on that within this kind of framework and model. About a minute left, uh, please, Albert. Uh, this is a render from the outdoor patio looking towards the complex. And even, even though there is a sense of separation and privacy at the patio, there's also this visual connection that is happening. Uh, our, our hope is that this will promote a more social interaction within your neighbors. Um, there's uh, one of our colleagues, Shara Z, did these peak solar radiation studies of the building. Um, and then we also wanted to implement this kind of passive, passive building strategies like adding trellises, recessed windows, large shade trees, and vine screens within the architecture and the landscape. And we also wanted to incorporate active building strategies like solar panels, solar thermal collectors, green roofs, radiant heating, gray water systems, and reversible ceiling fans as to implement and to help to achieve the carbon neutrality. Um, and then the structure of the units consists of mass timber framing and the structural insulated panel, also known as ZIPs. ZIPs are these kind of prefab walls that are known for their insulated properties and quick assembly. Since our design has been has more building service than a typical fourplex apartment, we thought that the use of SIPs as a construction method would allow for the units to be erected at a faster speed than traditional stick framing. Um, and lastly, uh, there's a render from the interior living space. As you can see, we wanted to expose the mass uh, timber framing as well as the SIPs. And we want to create this kind of warm but minimal aesthetic. And you can also see the connection between the living space and the outdoor spaces. And, um, you know, and also like uh, because the living space is on the second floor, we, we are able to have more light come into the space as well as as well as more airflow. Um, and one of the things, the low rise competition allowed us to explore what low rise multifamily in LA housing could look like. And Hidden Gardens was kind of like the outcome of our exploration. Um, and that's kind of it. That's terrific. Hey, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, I need to take a nap. That was intense, right? So listen, Daniel, I want to start with, uh, with something. And by the way, uh, to our audience, this session is being recorded and will be available uh, after we conclude uh, today. Also, um, I don't think we're going to have time for many questions from the audience. But if you'd like to type a short one in into the Q&A, we'll fit them in if we can. Uh, Daniel, when I fly into Los Angeles, uh, I see hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of square miles of one story structures with private parks called backyards. Who decided that that was a good model? Did it, did it start after World War II when the people were coming back and we needed to sell land and create jobs and sell building problems, put people to work? How did that happen? Oh my goodness. Uh, I'll bet you Christopher can give a better response to that, but it is true. It's even prior to the war. I think some of that really got its foot in uh, in the 30s and 40s in terms of the planning, which is really the advent of the single family um, planning as a tool. Um, but I would, I would love to hear what Christopher's opinion is on that. If he's by the mic. <laughs> I am by the mic, but I okay. want to to you guys. I'm, I'm more curious to hear what the, what the architects in the room um, uh, have to say about that history. Well, there you have it. So there, well, you weren't, you weren't saved by Christopher. But I'll, no. I'll, but, I'll t but I'll tell you something, um, when, when I go by um, on the expo line, right? I go on the expo line out to uh, Santa Monica and I see single family home, single family home, single family home next to transit, 
right? Mm-hmm. Yikes. So how possible because of, you know, nimbyism and people buy, buy properties thinking that they're buying into a single family neighborhood to kind of do a warning shot as, as cities could tell people, listen, this is so this is zone today for single family homes, but in 25 years, we're densifying it. So just to let you know. All right. And then, and then we set, set up a, a, a scene uh, because it seems to me this fourplex that you've all done, which is beautiful, would be really appropriate ad- adjacent to transit like that. Completely agree with you. And the irony of all these wonderful presentations is that everything each team proposed is currently not legal in the city of Los Angeles. And I think, you know, it's just the irony of the program. But to speak very specifically to your question, it began with ADU law because Los Angeles, I think it's 2019, approved 4,000 ADUs, right? That's adding density to neighborhoods. And um, a lot of people didn't pay attention too much to it, but then lately people began to notice, how come they got to build that house in their backyard? And then they, people, a lot of people are not aware of the state law until it pops up in their neighbor's yard. So education of everyone about this is coming is absolutely true. I couldn't even speculate on how long it will take to change policy in LA to do the kind of things that these teams presented and that Christopher had the vision for. So it's a really great question. Oh, good. Well, Can I add that? yeah. So there's the SB9, which is under state legislation. I don't know where it's in the process, but so, but, but it would allow, like the ADU law that it's state, you know, mandated, it would allow four units on every single family home. I don't know how that that happens. And it certainly wouldn't work within our framework of setbacks and parking requirements and everything like that. But I think that's a really important thing for everyone to kind of keep their eyes on and, and watch. And then there's also a potential SB10, which would be in certain areas as designated by cities, you could have up to 10 units. So hopefully we're all moving in the right direction. But I think part of this competition, which was was really great, was to, sh- to show people, hey, dens- density doesn't have to be scary. It- it's mm-hmm. okay. Car, we, I wanted um, to just comment on this too. That actually, I mean, I have the, the understanding I have about the the reasons that we have the single family zones that we have, and they are so ubiquitous, is actually a kind of a political one. Also, that in the twenties, single family zoning was also code for white people zoning, and most of the LA area, most LA neighborhoods actually have covenants dating from around there and specifying what kind of race of people can live in those neighborhoods, whereas denser neighborhoods were the only ones that were allowed to be um, multiracial or anybody of color could live in. So that, and that's kind of the case around a lot of the US. It's a little bit something that is becoming more aware to people the same way we suddenly realized that everyone built Confederate statues in the 1920s. But uh, there's a wonderful book called The Color of Law, which talks about how um, segregation was essentially often created. Like a lot of people think it's, oh, it's economics, you're rich people in these neighborhoods. It actually was created by, you know, government policies that restricted, you know, that basically didn't didn't like or allow, you know, multifamily, multicultural neighborhoods. So it's kind of a fascinating thing that I think is just the tip of the iceberg. People are understanding it, but it's one of the reasons that cities like say Minneapolis have decided to just abolish all zoning because they realize that the whole history of zoning and the lack of planning, the lack of progressive planning that's ubiquitous in America is largely because of um, sort of systemic racism. So just yeah. saying, that's another part of it. Well, we, that's, boy, we could do a symposium on all day one on that, couldn't we? Hey, Cara, in, in case somebody doesn't know the wonderful um, uh, gen, uh, genesis of on giving, tell us what it means. It's a Swedish word that means the way a space feels around you. Ah, okay. So it incorporates everything, you know, all your senses and Things like that, Victor. Um, I, I loved I loved your your project. That was really a family compound, right? I mean, yes. that's 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 what it is. And this is kind of a related question. What when did we start? You know, some some cultures have that familial compound thing. It's just it's just natural. But somewhere along the way in America, we decided, and it's tied to the single family home thing, that it was a really great idea to break away from mom and dad and be independent and have our own backyard and barbecue. And and like, what the hell happened? Because it, it seems it, to me compound living makes a lot more sense for babies. It, it does. Support. It, it does. But within our, our the, the Latino community, we're so tied in with each other that we want to take care of each other. You know, when we were kids, our parents took care of us. 
And then as we get older and the, our parents get older, we want to take care of them. So that's why we're so tied in the community. I, it's not only seeing it in the Latino community, but I see it in, in the Asian community and all these other communities that, that are very tied together. And allowing this type of project, this kind of concept, gives us the opportunity to uh, take care of each other. At the same time, be independent from each other. Yeah. You know, and that's what we're looking for. And, and that's what it, it makes it so much real for me and for the fat for my family and how we could use this property. And going back to um, the single family with the yard backyard, you know, it comes down to the American dream, you know, living in an apartment complex and everything growing up, my dream was to have my own piece of land and where I could have a yard that I could work with it just like Tia Rosa, Tia Elisa is using right now is what can we go what's the next step for this mm -hmm. and this allows it to go to the next step to to design a community where it's a smart density and it works well and we're proving it that it works well and that comes back to our heritage our our, our own uh, lifestyle of taking care of each other. Thank you, Victor. Hey, Barbara, um, I was fascinated by the, the pinwheel concept that you have behind the existing structure. I, I, I presume that you would anticipate that that pinwheel would be uh, a single ownership. It would be a rental. Am I correct on that? Well, that, I mean, you could probably, we could probably work it out in a way that would fit within the parameters of small lot also where, you know, you, you maintain a six inch separation between units. But yes, this idea was that it would be a single, it would be a single structure. I mean, that's kind of what the McKinsey report research shows that if you can just build this one building that's, you know, that has four units in it in regular wood frame construction, that is by far the least expensive way to build. So it was kind of trying to follow that big picture, like what if we could do some legacy projects, you know, for California that show like, here's a way to do a lot more density. It's a lot more density than an ADU, frankly, you know, if you could do it. Right. So I- But that ties into the other, the subdivision one, which is dividing the lots. So it's almost like you could have entered that in both categories because I, I really think that's a great alternative um, to these lots because they are, some of them are really big and if you set if you subdivide them then it right. automatically creates smaller parcels that are more affordable for people to purchase. And Karen I agree and particularly you see that in alley loaded things which is why we sort of chose an alley loaded situation because it let us pull, push the cars to the periphery we did load them from both sides but that was to get that space in the middle that we were really after. Yeah space is very older. important to oh. make sure that it's there for the for the family. A lot of older units like in Venice are, um, are, you know, the issue often is the flag lot issue. Like if you have to drive a car way down to get to that back deep lot, that gets kind of tricky. If you can either reduce or get rid of parking requirements, which is one option, or allow like the parking to be separated from the legality of the by right housing, then you can kind of just put parking at the street side and everyone can walk to their unit. That's that's something that's also not currently you're not currently able to do that by the small lot regulations. I got it, um, Albert. I have a question related to this kind of um, density that we have on the, the these lots. Who becomes the police officer of the community? Right. I mean, it's one thing to have single family homes, and so you know a neighbor can you know turn up their music a little bit. You could call them and say, "Hey, could you turn it down a little bit?" But when everybody's kind of on you know really really close. Who's the arbiter of the community and what's acceptable and what's not? That's something that seems to me to be a, a big glaring thing that, may, I don't know, could, could we do a public policy where we talk about behavior and how it's gonna, how it's gonna you know, self-police? What do you think, Albert? Well, I think it goes back to um, you know, being comfortable with your neighbors and being friendly with your neighbors. I feel like sing, single family uh, zoning has created this kind of I live in my little own lot, like, don't bother me. Right. When you talk about multifamily housing and like these proposals that we're kind of talking about. We're talking about this kind of social interaction and connection that can happen. And the idea behind that is that once you start to understand your neighbor, like talk to them, see them every day, every morning, you become friends. And then you can, you know, if somebody, if he's like playing Bob Misa, you can just go up to him and be like, hey, do you mind like turning it down a bit? Uh, so there is kind of like this, um, kind of a social kind of situation that's happening within our projects that uh, is kind of diluted when you think about single family zoning. 
And like, right. and when you think about like neighborhoods and communities as a whole, like, you know, like crime, safety, like that all happens because we've been like kind of isolated in our own little box instead of just like communicating with people, like seeing them every day, uh, you know, uh, so that kind yeah. of thing. Okay. Yeah, and they still develop and, a, a, a uh, what they call a uh, community association naturally. Gotcha. So just like I, I live in a 50 unit adaptive reuse building built in 1898, we have CCNRs. So that regulates behavior and, and et cetera. So I think that's, you know, one of the ways that, you know, we could do about to go about doing it. But I got to tell you, when I was growing up, this is where I got out my cane. When I was growing up, it was always about the good of the community. And nowadays it seems about to be about the rights of the individual. And that seems to conflict <laughs> with what you're saying, Albert. So I think we just got to maybe do some growing pains and, you know, see and see, you know, see how it goes. Hey, there was a question. This is a broad question that's kind of out, out of the realm of the uh, of the panel, but I, we, I'll, I'll throw it in and anybody can just chime in for it. How can we reverse the call culture? car culture in LA like Copenhagen. <laughs> Who wants that? I was just answering that one in, in my trying to type it out. Well, I, that's such an intro because obviously like they have built the most amazing infrastructure for bicycle commuting and public transportation is, is pretty decent, like train based outside the city. But, but the secret fact of Copenhagen is that they have a very top down policy where to buy a car in Denmark is something like a 250% tax. So you pay two and a half times the cost of the car to buy a car, which the government does in order to have no one buy a car so everyone has a bike. So it's, you know, there's chances of us that, ha that happening in a contemporary America, are not super high, but that is, that's a really big, interesting one, fun fact. Yeah, we'll, well, do that, and, we'll, we'll do that in the next lifetime, I think, you know, it, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Hey, one of the things that I noticed about um, some of these wonderful projects is that, um, it's a two two stories. So the 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 house is next door, but there's there's a two story house next next door. Um, the, these people didn't rec you know bargain for that. So do you like not do windows on that side so there's a privacy thing that's not interrupted there? I'm thinking of the pinwheel specifically, Barbara. I noticed that two story buildings you know next to these one story buildings. Um, I don't, well, I have a three-story building, but it's not, I mean, it's separated by about 15 feet from the one-story buildings, and then each of them, each of their windows are only on the exterior side, so there's not a, they don't have, it, it wouldn't be hard to stagger them, I and mean, they have regular setbacks from the side yards. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I mean, that would, you wouldn't want, like, you, would, you couldn't smash them up next to each other, obviously, yeah. but that wouldn't, that wouldn't be the hardest thing to solve for. It's definitely an evolving paradigm, though. And Karen, I'll just go for a second, and you can follow up. Is because um, the there are lots of communities, and you can all picture this, where you have two-story houses that are six feet apart, um, and that's part of what's driven by real estate costs. So it's cultural. And Hal, it's it is not a difficult question to grapple with. That if I bought an 850 square foot bungalow in, ha in Hancock Park, um, and then somebody comes in and builds a two or three story. Um, home next to me they overlook my yard yes yep that's there um and there's there's uh there are some ways that it could be mitigated by window placement and other things but it really comes down to a question of expectations and i think as we continue to discuss this with communities and with one another we may have some interesting ideas on how to culturally manage that but it's a tough question and i agree well, with you that's that's where your nimbyism is going to go crazy mm -hmm. and, you know it may like you say maybe the window is higher on the wall so you you aren't looking out but you have air and you have light you know uh coming in hey guys it's uh, it's 1255, so I want to just kind of be mindful of that, so we'll, we'll uh, wrap up on time. Listen, one of the greatest things in the world about uh, public policies is they can really, you know, change things. And Karin and I had the, had the privilege of working together 21 years ago when the Adaptive Reuse Ordinance was passed, and we started converting buildings by right by right into residential, like by right and cities don't go together, right? And, hmm. it, it, and you know, certainty is the, is, you know, uh, is the handmaiden of the, uh, de development to make, you can just do it, buy it, take the risk out, bankers love it, everything else. How could we, uh, and it, by the way, it didn't cost the city of LA one hard dollar, nothing. It cost nothing. It, it took marshalling city city staff to start getting along and Hamid Beydad helped, helped do that. But what can we do as the takeaway from our discussion today? 
how can we change public policy so that we can allow the kinds of wonderful projects that you have designed actually happen without being blocked by NIMBYs? I got you breathless, right? I have, I have some specific thoughts. Well, I think we saw the two biggest uh, issues with code compliance of some of these schemes is setbacks uh, in today's code and parking requirements. So that's one thing to really address right off the bat. Um, and front yards are completely underutilized in the city. Mm -hmm. So like just really rethinking that. But um, I think making things easier, like shared easements for driveways, parking, shared spaces, like right now, that's just really hard to do cumbersome. And, you know, landowners don't know how to deal with that or have money to get attorneys and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and also if there are tax incentives for kind of ecological performance, hmm. um, I think that could really, you know, or other ways to have tax incentives, but incent incentivizing, I think those are, those are some things we were thinking of. Mm -hmm. Uh, this question is for Christopher. Christopher, this is coming from the audience. So I'm going to make you answer this one. So what are the next steps towards now doing something with all these great ideas that you uh, have elicited from this group? What's the city going to do? Well, thanks, Hal. I was just typing out an answer to that. Um, the, the first uh, part is that we're taking the winning designs out to a range of communities and conversations like this one. Um, which we were just starting to do in person and now unfortunately looks like those will have to be virtual again for the time being um, to get feedback we're folding that feedback into the key policy updates that I mentioned in uh, very close work with our Department of City Planning in particular the housing element of the general plan and the various community plan updates as an example of that um, there's already discussion about uh, the particulars of setback requirements and I think really encouraging uh, introduction of more uh, retail spaces, corner stores at small scale in uh, residential neighborhoods, um, even single family ones across the city. That's an element that has been popular so far in the uh, Boyle Heights community plan update. Um, and finally, really building consensus for uh, a more productive conversation that can be prepared to help us respond to proposals as Karn mentioned from Sacramento, like SB9, like mm -hmm. AB 1401, which is another proposed legislation which uh, involves uh, reduced parking requirements and housing production that's making its way through Sacramento. In, in general, we've had a very reactive reaction. Some of those uh, uh, housing reform proposals from Sacramento have sort of been rejected out of hand by the city council without really any debate. Uh, we want to be helpful in preparing a more robust and, and thoughtful and engaged conversation about what um, those proposals mean, because ultimately, as the ADU reform shows, most effective housing reform is going to come at the state level just right. because of how our housing policy is set up. Uh, but it needs to be supported at the local level uh, to work. That is shown in a positive way in terms of how ADUs have really grown, as others have talked about and in a negative way in terms of how housing reform proposals have really not found any receptive conversation uh, in the last couple of years from Sacramento. So we're trying to change that dynamic and we think we already have begun to change it. Well, thank you very much. And that is a terrific place to wrap up our panel today. Christopher, thank you so much uh, for this. Daniel, thanks again for uh, organizing it. It was an idea that we had at lunch. You had at lunch and you bounced it off me and and then you know we all got here, uh, Victor, just loved seeing your your designs and Albert and Karen always and Barbara. Um, it's just terrific. And I'd like to thank Cassie Cherry for being our producer and, uh, and doing a great job. So thanks everybody. And we're gonna let you go so you can go earn some money. And um, listen, one thing that I'd like to say for any developers that are in the audience uh, today, um, think about hiring these people. You know, they, they won't ask you for that business, but I'm a salesman. And if you sit there long enough, I'll sell you. So hire these people. They're terrific. And uh, let's do some best practices and have a great day. Thank you, Hal. Everybody. Thanks, right, Hal. Thanks again.